the participant list is uh, a few many names I can I do know and several I don't so uh, welcome thank you for the opportunity um, so uh, as John said I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, the Atlas Living Australia and I'm, I'm actually going to try and cover as much of it as I can uh, um, with a focus on uh, how the Atlas sort of is being used in citizen science space and um, uh, and um, used more generally as well, how, how citizen science data contributes to uh, to broader use of ATLAS data in, in research. Um, Peter, just, just quickly, you're black at the moment. Uh, I'm black, is my screen not showing? It's not showing on mine. Ah, that's interesting, okay. Uh, is that's that it. better? That's better. Ah, okay, that's interesting. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I'll kick off. Um, the, the ALA is uh, uh, funded by the federal government under uh, National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. It's a commitment that uh, the government's um, uh, made to research um, scientific work uh, across all domains and uh, we are one of 27 facilities that are funded under that program. Um, and um, our particular focus is around biodiversity information. So it's one of the, uh, from a budget point of view, it's one of the smaller programs. And basically the INCRIS the facilities provide infrastructure for, uh, to enable um, more effective uh, and more rapid research, I guess is one way to, to uh, phrase it. Um, the investment in infrastructure um, is in, you know, large kit. There's some very expensive things. For example, the uh, um, synchrotron um, atomic collider uh, down at Monash is one of the facilities that's funded as well as the Australian contribution to the Square Kilometre Array Telescope and uh, a whole, whole range of other things. All the, the, the uh, monitoring buoys out in the Southern Ocean um, uh, funded through the INCRIS program. So there's some very big and very expensive equipment that in individual organisations can't fund for themselves or you know, would struggle to fund for themselves. Um, so uh, this is a, one of Australia's, uh, the, the Australian government's investments into the scientific uh, research sector uh, in Australia. Um, and it's unique in the world as, as far as I know, uh, in terms of its breadth and scope and, and um, focus. So uh, um, what, uh, what the, uh, the ALA does is essentially um, aggregate biodiversity information from any source we can get. And there's, there's thousands of sources of biodiversity data all over the place. And, um, um, our role is essentially to gather that all together and, and uh, standardise it and make it freely accessible for, um, uh, for research and policy and decision making um, and, and management in the field as well. Um, so we started back in 2009. Um, I mean, as a project, that there was a pilot project that started earlier than that, but uh, it really kicked off in its current form in 2009 with uh, um, a fairly significant injection of funding um, as part of the um, global financial uh, crisis response. Um, and so with that, we've been able to build a, a, a whole range of, of tools, I guess, to, uh, to help mobilise data. So we've got tools for getting data into the system, um, tools for discovering, navigating and finding, finding information. Um, there's currently about uh, just under 90 million records um, in the ALA and um, uh, you know, it takes some sort of big computing power to, uh, to manage all of those. Um, there's, there's tools for visualising the information and also analysing it. And so we, uh, we have that full pipeline of, of uh, services that uh, bring data together and make it available for, uh, for downstream applications in a standardised format. 
is it possible for my volume to go up a bit? I don't know. Um, <laughs> let me let me know if that's any better. I've just upped my volume a little bit, but uh, I'm not sure whether that's going to up the mic volume. Um, <clears throat> In terms of data capture, so there's there's lots of different sort of mechanisms for getting data into the system. I look after many of them, not all of them, um, and as part of my portfolio in the in the atlas, um, there's uh, direct physical upload functions. There's machine to machine upload functions uh, that we have. Oh, good, thank you, Janet. <laughs> um, there's uh, self-service data upload. So we've got a what we call a sandbox where people can actually, if you've got legacy data sets lying around somewhere that have biodiversity information, you can dump them into that and uh, map them to the standard terms and, and uh, put them into the upload pipeline. Um, so they're, they're, they're sort of services that our, our data team runs. Um, the BioCollect system is a field-based data capture system uh, that we run uh, to support any kind of, of um, data capture in the field uh, from simple um, template-based um, uh, projects through to quite complex, uh, sophisticated uh, method-based projects. Uh, the iNaturalist system, which has replaced our sightings function in the Atlas. Um, we used to have a sort of a, a homespun version. Um, this is for um, ad hoc um, single record based occurrence observations and um, the iNaturalist uh, platform based in the US is, uh, is very good. Many of you will be aware of it. Uh, it's very good, has a lot of uh, capabilities um, which um, uh, sort of marry quite well to the, um, you know, and the, the application um, uh, people who sort of support and run the application, actually the ethos is very consistent with the way that, uh, that of the Atlas. The Digivolve platform is a crowdsourced digitization system that we run in partnership with the Australian Museum. Uh, it's a brainchild of, uh, of the Australian Museum and uh, we, we basically provide the infrastructure um, and support for that and the application is uh, essentially run and serviced by Australian Museum staff and volunteers and um, uh, has been an outstandingly successful partnership uh, for us. It, it's essentially used to convert um, analog information in field sheets, uh, museum specimen labels, um, herbarium specimen labels, um, camera traps, uh, camera trap images and so on into, oh, and field notebooks into digital information that can then be, um, you know, used. And many of those sources have occurrence data within them, and that occurrence data is then um, brought into the ALA. The, um, uh, the merit system, some of you may be familiar with that. Um, it, it's a system we uh, developed and host on behalf of the, of the federal government's environment programs. Um, and essentially all of the federal funding to um, uh, uh, environmental in interventions uh, is funneled through the merit system and the programs. Um, the species profile tool um, is a platform for essentially curating, um, creating, managing, and curating descriptive, authoritative descriptive content for species. It's it's like a, a content management system, but but uh, uh, centered around taxonomy. Um, and a zootrack system is is a system that that uh, is used for animal tracking, um, where individual uh, sensors are placed on individual animals and they're tracked or sensors are placed in the environment and, and uh, um, animals passing by those sensors get tracked. And um, uh, so that, that's also a system that we host. Now in terms of uh, citizen science, the, uh, the tools that are applicable um, in our portfolio, at least anyway, is um, uh, BioCollect and the associated mobile, the um, uh, iNaturalist application and the Digivolve um, platform. 
data discovery tools and visualization tools, and I lump these together because they're sort of one and the same in, in some respects. You, you search for something um, through discovery and then you visualize the results. So um, in the Atlas, you can search, you know, all 89 million records um, by species, by or any taxon um, node uh, in, the, in the hierarchy. Uh, you can also search by common names where they are uh, provided. Um, you can search by locations or regions. There's, pro, there, there's um, dozens of different layers that have been indexed for, uh, for um, uh, predefined regions. So it's uh, IPRA regions, um, so, so biodiversity regions or um, uh, natural resource management regions or local governments or states or um, whatever. Um, we have those layers in and essentially they act as a, a cookie cutter um, through the occurrence records that occur within those particular defined areas. Um, there's a tool for, um, for assessing uh, what records have been made within a particular a radius of a, of a certain point. Um, so if you're looking at say what's been recorded in your neighbourhood, um, you can um, navigate the data that way. There's an active dashboard that's got um, uh, essentially break up by all sorts of different uh, categories and you can navigate through that um, by category or you can navigate by collections. So these are the uh, 150 or so collections of, uh, of specimens that exist within Australia and um, uh, uh, those those collections are in the atlas and you can navigate through the data sets that way um, or if you happen to know data sets or want to search by particular data set names you can you can do it that way the results um, are produced on um, in lists maps charts and image form so you can um, you know once you get a, a set of results you can you can slice and dice it lots of different ways there's about a thousand different attributes that uh, that we um, index and you can filter by those and then visualize the data um, you know by those different attributes and you can view it in context of a map or a list of records you can download them you can you can make annotations on them um, you can actually see uh, the verbatim record, that is what was actually provided to us, as well as um, how that's been augmented by additional information. For example, when we know a data point, um, we can do um, a drill down through a whole bunch of spatial layers and bring back all sorts of information associated with that particular location and link it to the record. Um, so in terms of, of citizen science use, uh, typically people are searching by species, location or region and, and viewing the data. Um, there's no reason why you can't use it for other reasons, you know, through these other channels, but um, uh, typically species and location are, are the most common ways of, of discovering information here. Um, and then there's a whole range of data analysis tools. So we've got a, a product called uh, Spatial Portal um, which has, it's essentially a, um, an analytical tool. Uh, it allows you to upload your own information um, and mix it with information from the Atlas and, um, and then uh, perform various analytical functions. So there's, there's a, a range of tools in there for um, environmental niche modeling, um, Scatter plot analysis, that's where you look at, at a particular species against a couple of environmental variables. So say for instance, elevation and temperature or um, uh, rainfall or humidity or whatever, whatever sort of parameters you think might be limiting factors for a particular species. And you can map out the distribution of those records in environmental space and look at, uh, at perhaps um, populations of that species that occur on the edge of the environmental envelope um, where they might be perhaps sensitive to um, changes in those environmental conditions or they might it might sort of um, uh, have certain properties for example uh, salt tolerance or um, uh, uh, tolerance of, of higher temperatures or that sort of thing where you can actually say um, uh, identify where those populations are if you're looking at perhaps building resilience into plantings that you might want to do. 
Um, and there's, there's all sorts of, of ways of sort of uh, viewing and analyzing the data within this particular tool. There's also a few other tools that uh, you may not be so familiar with. Um, we have a, bun a, a set, quite a large set of public application programming interfaces. These are machine to machine interfaces that um, uh, can be accessed. Um, and some organizations, for example, Monash University have a, um, an environmental monitoring program at, at one of their local wetlands uh, called uh, Jock Marshall Reserve. Um, they've actually built their own uh, specific version of the ALA um, species pages for the species that occur within the Jock Marshall Reserve and um, they're, they're using our API services to do that. So um, uh, they've basically customised it around their particular usage and I know there's others that are doing this as well. Um, so the APIs can be used in mobile apps and they can be used in, uh, in other websites. PhiloLink is a, uh, is a tool that's been developed for exploring uh, phylogenetic trees. So, so this is sort of um, uh, um, uh, essentially a, a genetic uh, based view um, that combines traits uh, genetic traits with um, species and um, uses the atlas, uh, you know, body of atlas data points um, to map those um, occurrences where uh, records have particular environmental or, or characteristic traits um, and they're mapped to a genetic tree essentially. So, uh, so that is, a, is an exploration tool for phylogeny. There's a, an R package that we've developed a set of R scripts. So R is a statistical package that's used by scientists a lot. And, um, and um, the ALA has developed a set of scripts that uh, use the, um, the APIs um, and package the information up in a way that is readily accessible and usable by researchers so that it's can, it can, you know, sort of fast track um, uh, usage in that sector. We've also got direct linkages into some, some high performance computing facilities that are sister facilities of the ALA and we've, we've in partnerships with uh, the Biodiversity and Climate Change Virtual Laboratory, which is a, a HPC uh, laboratory for rapid modeling of um, climate change variables in relation to biodiversity. Um, the eco cloud, which um, uh, combines um, essentially an education facility for, um, for use of these services uh, together with some, um, uh, some modeling capabilities. And um, a, a current project that's running at the moment is the species distribution models, which is working with state agencies and federal agencies to, um, to actually build a set of, of um, uh, uh, species distribution models that everyone can use um, and they'd be consistent. So um, yeah, it's a fairly, fairly, fairly large set of tools that we maintain and um, uh, it's it's sort of world leading technology. Just I, I put this slide in because it, it shows the um, the power I guess of bringing aggregated data together. So we've got um, uh, this is a national map of two subspecies of kookaburras, um, and it's drawn it's half a million records from fifty three data sets, many of which are citizen science data sets. I might add. And um, uh, it, it includes information from state um, databases. The, the, uh, um, all of the state agencies have their own uh, curated databases that they manage. And um, so we have relationships with all the state agencies and shared data there, but there's a lot of citizen science data in there as well. Um, and these are active maps, you know, so new records go in there all the time. And uh, 
um, you can see this. This was not possible before the ALA uh, came into existence. States would have their own view, um, but a national view um, would have only, it, it would have been possible within the Department of Environment, um, and um, which is now Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, um, because they, they basically got data from all the states, but um, they wouldn't have had all of the citizen science data. So this is, this is a, a fairly unique view of, um, of data for a particular species, and there's about 140 odd thousand species in there at the moment. Um, so a data ag aggregator's perspective. We have data records come from hundreds of sources, and in fact, thousands of sources. Um, we have singular, uh, single opportunistic sightings uh, come through from uh, iNaturalist, and um, I, I noticed someone mentioned um, uh, in the chat there, um, the Nature Mapper and um, and also Quester Game. Yes, they are both represented there. They both feed data through to the ALA. It all, all sort of uh, comes together. Um, and BioCollect, which supports uh, intervention activity projects as well as uh, survey assessment type projects. We are a node of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So there's, uh, there's many, many countries uh, contribute to GBIF. Uh, GBIF is essentially a global aggregator um, and we are the Australian um, uh, contribution to GBIF. Um, we work very closely with GBIF and um, uh, the Atlas infrastructure. Um, whoops, I'm just going to jump into this one. I'll, I'll just jump back to the other one in a sec. Um, the Atlas infrastructure is actually uh, supported by GBIF um, and promoted in um, many, many countries. We're currently live in uh, 25 countries. It's under development in an additional 13 countries, um, and that's growing all the time. Um, so um, why would people contribute to the Atlas? Well, there's a lot of benefits. I've put up here the Atlas Life um, uh, uh, data providers page. Uh, every data provider to the Atlas has its own page. And um, uh, it's a, a place where you can basically describe yourselves and what you do and, and so on. Um, and uh, your records get recognised. There's, um, there's data usage feedback, so you get uh, active reports on usage, uh, so where people download your data for as part of data sets that they download. Um, you, so you can see how it's being used um, and um, you, can, you can track usage. It's quite useful if you are putting up funding bids, for example, you can explain your, you know, sort of relevance and value that way. Um, and um there's there's also linkages so where where downloads have been used in publications we've got uh, linkages through gbif to um, document identifier um, citations and um, so you can see here for example the records that have been made by uh, members of the atlas of life group um, uh, there's 31,000 records in that group. You can go straight to those views, but they've been used in 80 publications, the uh, research publications that um, uh, have been produced, and you can navigate to those uh, through the GBIF site. So this link takes you straight to the GBIF uh, publication site. Um, there's also data quality feedback. So when you when you upload records, you get a, a data quality report that. Um, uh, will basically give you uh, information about um, the how the how the records uh, line up against the whole range. There's about 100 or so different data quality measures, and that report comes back to you as well. So there's there's a range of benefits there. Um, I mentioned DigiVol before, uh, so it's um, 
digitizing specimens, uh, specimen labels, field notebooks, um, uh, field data sheets and camera trap images. Um, an example of the effectiveness of that, um, and there's, I think there's about a million or so transcriptions in there at the moment, but um, the, the re recent bushfire work that was put up for Kangaroo Island um, uh, camera traps, um, there was, I think about, and Rhiannon might correct me or Paul might correct me, but um, I think it was about 3,000 records or something uh, transcribed within, within days of it going live. So it's, uh, it's very, very effective. Um, basically turns images into digital data and where there are species occurrences within that data, they get harvested and, and uh, become data points in the atlas. Um, they're also added to the museum records um, and museums actually sort of um, uh, have, have many, many, many um, objects that uh, uh, in storage that aren't actually databased, and this is helping to fast track the um, the, the databasing of those objects as well. Um, so, yeah, it's this is a, um, a freely available service, and and the um, uh, Australian Museum uh, volunteers and and support staff um, do a fantastic job of of um, keeping that system running. And um, uh, it's, it's been a very successful partnership for us, and uh, we'll continue continue that. Um, iNaturalist, we moved over to iNaturalist um, from our our um, sort of homespun observation tool, um, largely because uh, their their ethos is very similar to the atlases. They're very successful at what they do. They've got a very a very robust and very good platform. And um, and they um, they have a, a whole range of technologies that um, can assist in identification support, which we don't have, and um, and always struggled with. So it's been, that's been a very successful uh, relationship as well. Um, there's there's been many many projects set up in iNaturalist, um, many Australian projects. Um, but as I say, it's one one of many uh, platforms, and you know, there's you use a platform of choice. Um, you don't need to use iNaturalist. Um, the BioCollect system um, we developed and host and continue to evolve. Um, it's differentiated mainly because it, it's um, essentially a project and survey based system and supports a, a much more comprehensive or much more complex sort of um, type of data collection. Um, it's not just designed for citizen science, although the most, most projects that are in there are actually citizen science projects. Um, and there is a citizen science hub, which we host on behalf of the Australian Museum. But, uh, sorry, the, the um, Australian Citizen Science Association, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but it's also designed to support applied ecology and industry practitioners, um, researchers, uh, natural resource managers, and, and so on. Um, and uh, it's one of probably only two tools that I know of internationally that actually uh, enable um, such uh, comprehensive and complex um, sort of field-based survey data capture. Um, so, um, yeah, simple and complex uh, assessment and monitoring surveys, as well as uh, activity-based project management type functions uh, for, for uh, weed and pest management, restoration, rehabilitation, revegetation, that sort of thing. I mentioned um, BioCollect under, underpins, in, in fact, is the, um, uh, or a hub in BioCollect is the um, Australian Citizen Science Project Finder, that if you go to AXA, um, the AXA website, this is what you will find. Um, and uh, we have connections with the New South Wales government seed system uh, for sharing 
and enabling environmental data. Um, the people powered project discovery engine that the Guardian newspaper developed a few, a couple of years ago um, is also using the services from BioCollect to, um, to provide a different avenue for discovering projects and also um, projects for the education sector uh, being um, pulled from the BioCollect system into the STAR portal, which is run by the Chief Scientist's Office um, and uh, for educational purposes. We have a, a connection with the SciStarter system in the US, um, so you can do international discovery of projects through, um, through BioCollect without having to go to SciStarter, um, but um, and SciStarter has a similar sort of arrangement with uh, SITSci.org and the federal catalogue of, of, of projects in the US and uh, a number of other ones as well that I haven't represented there. European Citizen Science Association is actually about to launch um, their new project finder as well and um, are currently asking, uh, you know, um, for how they can connect to BioCollect and also to SciStarter. So we'll, um, uh, th these are, it's basically a hub and spoke model um, where um, uh, local and regional catalogues can be connected into the, into the sort of uh, the, the major ones that then talk to each other as well. So essentially you can find projects anywhere. Um, the NRM projects, uh, so this is, as I say, uh, restoration, rehab and uh, revegetation type projects. This is, you, you essentially use BioCollect in a, in a project management sort of context uh, where you, you undertake a set of related activities. They don't necessarily have to be biodiversity collection activities. They can be other things as well. Um, but uh, um, you basically build a schedule of things that you want to do and then you, you carry out that and you record as you go uh, through implementation and you can track and monitor and manage your implementation using this tool. Um, and for any activities that involve biodiversity, so it might be seed collection or um, uh, uh, revegetation or um, uh, you know, weed and pest management, any of those sort of things could be some sort of monitoring activity with nest boxes or um, camera traps or whatever. You can add those activities in there as well. And any occurrence records that are recorded in those activities can get harvested into the ALA and contribute to the overall um, set of records. For assessment and monitoring type projects, um, uh, these are the ones that use a, a sort of a single template um, for a, a survey and get used um, over and over again, um, different places and times, and, um, and build up a set of records around a common sort of um, data structure. And um, so we support this and it's highly configurable. Um, you can have very simple form templates uh, as uh, in the sightings template uh, in the middle there. You can also have very complex templates. Um, this one that you probably can't see very much of the detail, but that is a um, rapid riparian condition assessment template that is operated by the um, ACT uh, Region Water Watch Program to, um, uh, to look at the condition of, or record the condition of um, uh, vegetation along stream sides at monitoring points where they're, they're also monitoring um, the water quality and macro invertebrate uh, counts for those particular sites as well. And, and uh, periodically they do um, riparian condition assessments and together all of that information helps to interpret, um, you know, sort of what's happening with uh, water quality and the dynamics of those streams in terms of um, uh, health and biodiversity. So um, that's a transect based model that has auto calculations for uh, condition. Um, the uh, data access features, um, so data points um, are listed as records and you can view them on a list as, as here or you can do it on, uh, view them on a map. Um, oops. Um, or if they have images, you can look at them in a gallery form and navigate them that way. There's, you can search 
through them uh, and filtered by a whole range of different facets. Um, navigate to records, view individual records and so on. Um, the system supports um, permission-based editing and moderation. So uh, you can embargo records within this system and, um, and hold data sets. So for, for people who are using it for, for say, research papers, you might not want to um, publish the data until you've actually published your paper. You can actually set embargoes on that, um, on these as well. Um, and it's, it's yeah, quite, quite a sophisticated system. Uh, examples. Um, so, you know, if you're doing a, a survey and wanting the public to participate in your project, it would be a citizen science project. Um, and you can set that up. It's, it's free to use. You can go in there now and create a project and, and uh, start collecting data within um, you know, half an hour um, or less. Um, if you're undertaking a flora or fauna survey in an area or, uh, or some sort of systematic survey um, where you don't want the public involved but you want to use it to collect data, you can do that as well. Um, and we call that an eco-science project. The works type project is, uh, is the, a different style. That's the project management style one um, where you, you're looking to affect change at a particular place or a set of places over a period of time through a set of actions. And, and uh, um, these works projects allow you to basically construct that work program and record what you do to manage that project. Um, looping back to the main atlas. So, uh, so we've got lots of ways of navigating and visualizing. So you can do it by lists, you can do it by maps, you can, you can uh, filter and, um, change colours of records and, and um, uh, according to whatever the filter criteria are that you want to choose uh, and you can use then use those categories to change the visualisation of what's actually displaying on the map. You can also take what you view here and put it straight into the spatial portal where you can do further analysis. Um, there's a, a little button above the filter block called customize filters. So there's a set of default ones, but you can actually customize uh, with a whole bunch of additional filters in there if you want to. Um, and of course you can download the data once you've decided which, which data points you want. Um, there's chart based views of the information um, that is filtered. So these, these are all sort of contextualized to the filters you choose and um, you can navigate through that. They're active charts. You can navigate through to the data from the chart view. You can also do it through the image uh, galleries. The uh, explore by location area uh, um, sit situation, you've got a my area type thing. So you can put in an address or you can use your current address. You can set a radius and it will show you all the data that, that all the data points that have been recorded in a density grid um, or a heat map essentially of points and it'll list the species groups and the species that have been recorded within that radius um, and the numbers of them and you can navigate down through that they're all active links and um, and you can you can sort of drill down into smaller uh, sort of views so if you just wanted to look at say the amphibians uh, in that particular view you could you could do that and see the three records that that are the amphibian records within that particular area. Um, the uh, explore by region, there's a, there's a whole range of, of uh, predefined um, uh, sort of areas that you can select and they will bring back the records from within that and provide them in a similar type of view to what you see in the explore by location. Um, you can do this anytime you like. So if we, once we finish here, you might go, oh, I really like to look at that. Well, feel free to, um, ala.org.au. Um, species pages. Uh, so every species has a page um, and we bring together as much information as we can um, or much authoritative, I guess, information as we can about, about species. And we don't try to replicate the descriptive information um, uh, 
that already exists so much as actually make it accessible. So, you know, we provide a Google search by that by that species name, for example, and you can drill into Google to see the list of resources that uh, that Google provides. We just provide the filtered search to that. But where there's where there is authoritative information, we try to display that and make that directly accessible. Um, there's distribution information that comes from the record count. And we also include things like expert distributions when they've been uh, calculated. So for, for commercial fish, uh, bird species, and some of the uh, national weeds of significance, there are actually um, expert um, distribution um, extents, and we can show those uh, as well. But um, we also do derived extents based on the records that, that are there using the, um, uh, habitat, the um, uh, modeling functions. Um, the images. So we bring together a lot of images that come with records, um, the iNaturalist, the Quest again, the, the um, uh, Nature Mapper records and all of those, all of those ones that uh, come with images, those images uh, pulled into the atlas and provided um, uh, in a gallery format with the, um, uh, with the species page. It includes also things like uh, specimen images. So for birds, it'll include images of eggs, for example, perhaps uh, um, uh, images of the collection specimens themselves. Um, which of course are useful to researchers as well. Um, so there's in some cases diagnostics as well as uh, you know just in field images. Uh, names we get names primarily from the national species list. So this is a sort of a national consolidation of um, of uh, names and taxonomy, and um, uh, it's a curated source of names. Not always up to date with the most published, uh, most recent published names, but um, it's the most current version that we have from um, the names authorities uh, who, who vet and curate those names. Uh, literature. So we've got relationships with BHL, uh, Biodiversity Heritage Library, um, and most of the, um, the first publications of, of names in the literature are available through um, the Atlas literature page. Um, there's barcode uh, sequence information for genetic sequencing uh, for species. And um, we started work at one stage on relationships between species. That's still a work in progress. We haven't progressed that um, a lot, but uh, ideally, um, you know, that's a, another piece of work that that is on our radar as well. We also bring together conservation and biosecurity related information um, where it's available from relevant agencies um, nationally uh, and state based as well. So that you can see where, uh, what the conservation status is for a particular species in any jurisdiction. Um, that's actually a bigger job than you might imagine. So, <laughs> um, the uh, online resources, so we provide links to various resources for related to that species online um, and direct links to recording, um, making a record for that species or uh, submitting photos and that sort of thing. Um, so this is, I'll just whiz through these. There's, uh, that's just an example of what the, um, the names uh, page looks like. It includes uh, scientific names and um, uh, what's called synonyms, which are, are um, uh, generally sort of variations to the name over time. Um, and um, uh, as well as the current name and and also um, other types of names, so, uh, so common names where they're available, uh, indigenous names where they're available, um, and so on. Um, the classification structure, the hierarchy. Um, so this is based on the, the Australian National Species Lists, uh, and the, uh, it's a single taxonomic tree uh, from the major um, uh, names and taxonomy curation sources within the country. 
and uh, is generally a consensus view of, of names, uh, particularly for plants. Um, uh, animals is slightly different. Um, fungi is slightly different, but um, it's generally a consensus view of the classification structure in Australia. Um, and you can navigate through that upwards and down through the hierarchy and view individual pages. Uh, published literature, so um, where, where they're available from the Trove, that's the uh, National Library uh, of Australia um, Trove system or the Biodiversity Heritage Library, um, publications that include that species name um, and have been indexed are actually accessible through here. You can view the pages, you can read the manuscripts and so on. Genomic sequences, we've got links through to the um, uh, GenBank system, and uh, which, which is a major source, and also the, the BOLD system in Canada, uh, where they're, they're major international registries of genetic information, and so we have linkages for these species. Um, so you can navigate through to those sequence, uh, sequences. Um, also data partners. So these are, this is a list of all the data resources that contribute records of that species. And you can navigate to those data resources directly from a species page and see the, um, the data resource page for that. The, uh, the spatial portal, so this is a link from a view of, uh, you know, sort of navigated view of records for, for gorse in this case, um, to the spatial portal view of those where you can then start accessing the sophisticated features and tools of the spatial portal without having to go and search for that, that particular set of species again. Um, you can do things in here like area reports. So this is a, a summary report of everything we know about it, including the conservation status, the numbers of species, numbers of records, um, uh, the uh, of different groups of species, um, and a whole, a whole range of other information. Um, you can get an online one, you can get a PDF one, and uh, that's often used by um, local governments and uh, consultants and so on that are doing uh, reports for proponents for uh, planning applications. Um, and you can see on the left there, there's a whole range of different tools that you can use um, and uh, as, as, as free online services. Some of them are quite sophisticated and, and need a bit of uh, support. Um, and there are support articles for those tools in the system as well. Um, this is a scatter plot tool. You can see uh, a particular part of that uh, environmental envelope's been um, had a bounding box put on it, and you can see where the records are highlighted in space, um, where those populations are that share that set of characteristics. Um, you can import your own data into the spatial portal, so you can you can uh, pull up a whole bunch of data from the atlas based on whatever criteria you want. And then you can you can also, if you've got a particular data set, say in, uh, there's an example in, in the system where uh, someone was looking at wind turbines. Um, so they, they uploaded the points, spatial points for uh, a set of wind turbines and they wanted to look at the um, relationship between that and particular species occurrences um, to, to see sort of, um, whether there was likely to be any, any impact um, on species, uh, you know, flight paths or distributions and so on. And that, that's a bit of a quick run through. I'm, I'm happy to take um, any questions if so what, we have time. <laughs> so what we'll do, Peter, is there's been some questions entered into the um, chat as we've been going along. And what I'll do is I'll read them out to you and you can, um, you can answer them as we go. Excellent. Excellent. So the first question is from Michelle. Um, we'd love to see how you, uh, how to drill down to see, for example, how many koalas have been seen in, a, in my area, please. Ah, so. Are you up for a live demonstration? Yeah, I can do a live demo. Um, let me, let me open. So 
So you can you can either um, do it through um, through this mechanism and view records here. Go to a map and oops, drill in. Come on, drill into that map. Oops. So for the person in question, Peter, it'd be sort of the um, Gold Coast type, Gold Coast Sunshine Coast area in Queensland. Yeah. So, so you can either do it by by drilling into the map, and you can you can actually do a um, bounding box or a circle. So um, I'm just going to. Oops. So there's Gold Coast and. You can just go so viewing all the records in that location. So these are koala records. And then you can drill down on individual records and view that. So that's one way of doing it. Um, alternatively, you could simply go to explore your area, type in coast. Um, any of those records you can then drill into. And you can see the details. So that, that's not a species, that, that's not a koala record in particular. I'm not sure why, I'm just, uh, that's a butterfly record. Um, we should be seeing a list of species in the, in this panel, and I'm not sure why that's not. So, um, which is a bit curious. It looks like there's an indexing problem. Um, so, okay, the the joys of live um, yeah, live, joys demonstration. Of live demos. So we have we have actually had an indexing problem uh, with the system in the last. Um, few days, so it's possible that that's what that is. That they're just not indexing and, and hence not not displaying properly. Um, I'll make a note of that. Yeah. And it'll, it'll get fixed tomorrow. So, um, but anyway, that's that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, you you will get a list. So that's basically just saying what's uh, within a kilometre of the point that I've put in. Um, and if you want to search for a particular address, you can put your address in there. And um, you can move that around. Oops. Ah. Um, and that will just dynamically adjust and um, and give you the the new points. Oh, here we go. Look at that. Um, it's obviously lagging a little bit for some reason, but. Um, this will dynamically change and you, it, it's an all species thing, but if you wanted to say, look for koalas, you can you can sort of drop down here. And I know that um, that's not a particularly um, easy way to, uh, <laughs> to find things if you don't know the species name. So, but you can just go common name and, and navigate your way down there. Um, Okay, Peter, I'd, I'd suggest we move on to the next question if, sure. if you answered. Um, Paul has asked, does anyone use the SEED website as in capital S, capital E, capital E, D? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. It's relatively new. Um, it's only, I guess, been launched in the last couple of weeks. It's for two, three, four weeks, something like that. Um, and it's a New South Wales government system. So I, I, I don't know how it's being used or who's using it at the moment, but um, they are pulling um, project data out of, so it's only project metadata, they're not pulling all the data um, to make projects discoverable through that system. And uh, we haven't actually quite completed the round trip yet. So the seed systems pulling projects out of BioCollect we haven't yet got to pulling projects out of seed. 
and, and doing a deduplication exercise. So um, that's yet to be done. Fair enough. Um, I've got a question from Debbie. Um, she asks, how do you avoid duplication of records? She goes on to say, I study digital citizen science and I know that volunteers sometimes upload the same record to different platforms. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question because um, sometimes, yeah, that's right, they, they can appear in different platforms and uh, different platforms can do different augmentation of uh, records. So, for example, I, I mentioned uh, that the Atlas can do things like uh, a drill down of, of information. So you can see here we've got a view original versus processed. Here's the original that came to us and this is the information that's been augmented because we, we know what it is and where it is and when it was collected and that sort of thing. So we can actually add things like taxonomic hierarchy um, to the record. We can do things like um, add certain um, uh, information about location. So we know that we know where it is. So we know that it's in the um, Gold Coast local government area. Um, Different systems will do add different things, um, some of which is more useful for users than others. Um, and so, what we do in the ALA is we look at um, one of the one of the sort of uh, tests that we run over every data data point that comes into the atlas is is um, a potential duplicate test, where we look at uh, the name, uh, the date. Um, who submitted it, where it is, so it's location. And where we get strong alignment of those things, we flag the potential duplicates and say, you know, these are all likely to be the same record. Um, we leave it up to the user to decide which one of those is the one that they want, but um, because of the fact that, you know, different systems will augment the, the data in different ways. But um, uh, the... Um, yeah, we, we do actually do duplicate detection and flag yeah. what, is, what is potentially a duplicate. Okay, Lib Libby asks, do you have any metrics uh, available on who is using uh, what sort of ALA data? So in terms of who, as in individuals, uh, no. But we do have, um, I'll just go down to the, Incidentally, all the all the test information is in there too. Um, <clears throat> we do have this thing called a, a dashboard, which you can navigate through, um, and you can see um, like data provider, institutions, downloads by reason. So you can see the number of records that have been downloaded for a particular purpose. So ecological research, for example. Um, 4.4 billion uh, records and 366,000 download events. So, um, and citizen science records, you know, 624 and a half million records and 15,800 download events uh, by yeah. citizen scientists. So we don't we don't sort of have any record of um, you know sort of IP addresses or who's actually doing the downloading, um, but we do track the, the summary type information. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Libby goes on to ask another question: um, How is AXA involved with natural resource management? Ah. Uh, or was oh, that a question probably, we might refer to? Uh, yeah, that's probably a question for AXA members, but uh, you know, sort of other AXA members. But um, from um, from my perspective, uh, a lot of sort of citizen science practitioners are also natural resource practitioners. That is, they they're involved in land care groups, or they're involved in. Um, you know, friends, uh, environmental friends groups, uh, so reserve friends groups and that sort of thing. And, um, and uh, Libby says are often, was are often involved slide. in things like improving the, the state of those, of those reserves or those, those local environments. And so, you know, that, that's 
I don't know the numbers. I don't, you know, I just know that that happens. Um, Debbie's got another question. In which way does BioCollect compete with iNaturalist? And in which ways is it, uh, sorry, compete? And in which ways is it different? Yeah, so they're actually complementary. Um, so iNaturalist uh, excels at individual record level occurrences. So you can, you can do uh, aggregations of records within a, a project context. So for example, if you're running a BioBlitz, you can set up a BioBlitz project in iNaturalist and all the records that are collected in that context can be viewed in, in, um, in that project as a collection of individual records. But at, the, at the, their core, they are still individual records. Um, there's no event level information that binds them together other than you know, this concept of a project that, that aggregates them. BioCollect, on the other hand, is designed for surveys. And um, so it, it starts from, the, con from the, the pretext that you have an event in which data is collected. And, and that's a really different concept, um, which is actually allows you to do things like record absence data. And, um, and that allows you to do things like analyze, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, population dynamics and and um, uh, you know when you when you can actually record presence and absence information using systematic methodologies you can you can do um, much more with the data than you can with presence only so uh, there's, a, there's a fundamental not only at the data level but also at the conceptual level there is a fundamental difference between individual presence only observations which um, iNaturalist does and does very well, or uh, and and um, uh, survey-based information that 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 you know sort of allows you to um, you know collect a lot more than just simple observations. Fair enough. Um, I've got just two more questions, um, and I'm going to struggle with the, this person's name, Yi Wei. Um, would like to know. Uh, we noticed that a lot of the data provided seems to be more seems to be closer to the urban areas or um, on the road instead of in the forests. He asks whether this is um, usual or whether it's um, coincidence. I, my first thought is it's probably due to the people um, taking the uh, observations. But I'll leave yeah, that to you yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, citizen science activities tend to be more opportunistic my experience of it anyway tends to be more opportunistic rather than than sort of um, um, you know directed surveys that that are doing more sort of um, uh, randomized samples where you'd go into different areas that that and purposefully go into areas that aren't normally visited but but randomize the uh, the collection activity um, a lot of citizen science activities are a lot more sort of opportunistic and of course that's going to be where people are and where they go so it's not it's not that it's it's bad necessarily it just means that you know it's more data points which is good but um uh, you need to use sort of methods to even out and and account for the bias that you have in um you know that that sort of distribution of data points Okay, um, and our last question, I realize a couple of extra ones that have come through, but I, I, we're sort of starting to run out of time. Um, I will see if I can talk Peter into providing answers to those via email um, following this. Uh, and I hadn't asked him about that in advance, so he's gonna sort of castigate me for it at some stage. Um, the last one is uh, from Fiona. Um, there is some reluctance, sorry, it's something addressed to me, my apologies. Um, so I'll just pick up another one from Libby. Could we use BioCollect with NatureMapper? Um, I mean, you can use BioCollect and NatureMapper. I don't know whether you'd use it with NatureMapper. Um, you'd use them for different purposes. Um, you know, NatureMapper, like uh, Questa Game, like um, iNaturalist, are really good, um, you know, products for um, presence only type uh, records and um, 
and at, at record level. Um, if you want to do systematic survey work, BioCollect is better at that. So, um, you know, you can use both products, um, but um, you would need to use something like the Atlas to pull together the, the data from both systems and view it as an aggregated data set. Fair enough. Okay, and with that, we might draw it to a close. Um, I'd like to thank you, Peter, for your presentation. I certainly learned a lot from it. Um, the, the bits of um, the ALA that I've had involvement with are a minor fraction of the uh, overall thing I now realise. So I'd like to, uh, on behalf of everyone present, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, yeah, we will uh, see what comes up next time. In terms of next time, folks, we've got uh, next presentation is on the 17th of August, and we'll have Janet Anstey and Jesse Oliver talking about how um, citizen science engages the younger uh, younger um, people. Okay, and with thank that, you. thank you very thanks. much, one and all. Thank you, everyone, and thanks, John. And have a good night. <laughs>